humanities in a disenchanted age, which I think is raises a lot of questions um, for how we think about um, the humanities today by by delving into the uh, the, the history of, of the humanities in Germany, largely over the 19th century. Uh, Paul Ryder, as, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, is professor of Germanic languages and literatures here at OSU. He's uh, um, the co-author, author and, and editor of numerous books, um, including the anti-journalist Karl Kraus and Jewish self-fashioning in uh, Fantasy Europe, uh, published with Chicago in 2008, and on the origins of Jewish self-hatred, uh, Princeton 2012, and he's currently um, rather masochistically um, translating uh, or producing a new translation of volume one of Marx's Capital. Um, so uh, um, await the uh, the new translation and uh, the hand wringing of various Marxists when they realize that um, what they thought was uh, was reification all along is actually not reification and so forth. Chad Wellman uh, similarly is a professor of uh, Germanic languages and literatures at the University of Virginia and sim with a similar focus. And again, has written a lot of stuff and edited and co-authored a lot of stuff off, often with, with Paul. Um, he wrote Becoming Human, Romantic Anthropology and the Embodiment of Freedom, uh, published with Penn State in 2010, and Organizing Enlightenment, Information Overload and the Invention of the Modern Research University, Hopkins 2015. And um, having a conversation with them today and, and uh, discussing the book with them is, uh, is the History Department's own uh, Ying Zhang, who's also um, direct to Chinese studies here at OSU. Um, she's a specialist in medieval and early modern Chinese history, and she's the author of two books, Confucian Image Politics, Masculine Morality um, in 17th Century China, published in Washington in 2016, and Religion and Prison Art in Ming China, um, published uh, by Brill in, in 2020. And this conversation will last about 40 minutes. And thereafter, we'll open it up for questions. But I and I do want to say, if you've got any questions en route, just just put them in the chat, and I can and I can handle them at the end. So with that, uh, over to you, Ying. Oh, I thought um, they were going to do a quick discussion about uh, the book. No, it depends what they've decided to do. And if they haven't decided to do anything, then um, would you like to Polly and Chan, would you like to say a little bit about your book before I ask you a question? Paul would be delighted to uh, to give a brief, perspicuous, incisive uh, account, right, Paul? Uh, sure, um, I'm happy to start doing that. Um, but first, let me say, Chris, thank you so much for for organizing this. Uh, Laura, thank you too for for your help, Ying. Um, thank you as well, uh, and John Brook, uh, who uh, is the director of the Center for Historical Research, had a big hand in this as, as well. So thank you guys all for the support. I really appreciate it. And um, as to the book, uh, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling here and then turn it over to, to Chad. So um, the book really developed, as is often the case with these things, out of a an, an earlier, shorter project, Chad and I, we uh, edited an edition of Nietzsche's lectures on the German education system. And we, in doing this, became very interested in his critique of, of uh, <clears throat> the German education system, um, his discussion of the various pressures on it from the state, um, from corporations, uh, the pressure uh, on the system in his view uh, that resulted from democratization, the democratization of the education system. And it resonated in a lot of ways with more recent criticisms, in fact, contemporary criticisms and, and laments. And so uh, we wanted to see how far back uh, various strands of critique here went. And we started um, looking at the discussions around the formation of the modern German university, which we also see as helping to launch the, the modern humanities. And we found there um, two uh, discussions that resonate strongly with contemporary crisis talk. And so part of the, the project, a big part of the project is to, is to trace um, this discourse back in time and show how it's evolved. Obviously, we're not looking to make a, an eternal return of the same sort of argument. Um, and in fact, one of our key points uh, has to do with 
the moment when the idea that uh, crisis or the moment when crisis becomes an essential justification for the humanities, which doesn't happen for quite a while. That's, that's one of the main points of the book. And that doesn't happen until the, the, the late 19th century. Um, so uh, that's um, broadly speaking, some of what we're doing, one of the arguments we're making. Um, and now I wanna turn it over to, to Chad to, to give you the rest of the overview. Um, I'll just say two things. Uh, one, I would uh, say that I think our chief, our primary kind of organizing argument is that um, that the self understanding of the modern humanities didn't merely take uh, take shape in response to a perceived crisis. That crisis itself was constitutive of the modern humanities. And, and the modern here, and we could get uh, get into that uh, later if people are interested, is is, is key, because our, on our understanding of the modern humanities, as opposed to and in kind of contradistinction to, and actually, if you don't buy this premise, then the whole thing falls apart, and you can just stop reading, you know, uh, in the intro, is that it's not at all continuous with any of the the myriad other traditions, the Studio Humanitatis, kind of a Renaissance epochal reaching back across millennia. Um, but it really is bound up with the emergence of what we, for lack of a better term, the modern research university, uh, late 19th century and over the first half of the 20th century in the U.S. It's 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 a very presentist in concern. So the the modern humanities aren't about right ordered desires, wrongly ordered desires, um, a cosmic order versus a, a natural order. They really are and constitute themselves in relationship to a present concern. That concern could be the emergence of the natural sciences, right? Uh, as threatening not just finances within the university, but threatening or being perceived as threatening kind of a mechanistic worldview and thus threatening something about the soul here, kind of thinking about late 19th century uh, Germany. It could be uh, the threat of automation, Right? This was a discourse early in the 20th century, especially in the US. It could be the Soviet Union. Right, This was a kind of a post-war, Cold War discourse about the humanities that was uh, very important, of course, for the National Endowment for the Humanities. So on, on our account, the humanities, we're not talking about, and especially when we talk about the permanent crisis, we're not talking about a crisis uh, from some imagined uh, Greek or Roman antiquity. We're talking about the, the perceived need for a particular function within this modern university that is always defined in the negative. Um, and so I'll just, I'll stop right there. That's, that was one long point. Um, but I would also say just kind of personally, like why this book, why now? And I think Paul, I think Paul would um, kind of sympathize with, with, with some of these, but you know, I, as we were writing this book, I was uh, leading a big reform of the general education curriculum here at, at UVA, a seven-year project. And quite honestly, this book was a way for me to make sense of all of the disastrous uh, conversations and, and yelling matches and um, faculty fights that we had, which were actually kind of amazing because it did result in, in a real faculty-led project but which all of the categories I had up and running, the humanities, the sciences, the liberal arts, completely collapsed and turned out to be opaque uh, and politically, uh, politically kind of useless um, and, and quite dangerous. And so I think dangerous, I mean, dangerous in terms of trying to accomplish uh, something with a group of 700 faculty members. Um, so for me, at least this book, whether it you know, succeeds on its own or not, was also an attempt to understand that institution in which I found myself um, and which we were trying collectively as a faculty to do something uh, together. And this is how I tried to make sense of that. So I'll stop there. Okay, wonderful. Um, I have to say, I really like the UVA's uh, new GE um, configuration. I, I read the documents. I really liked it. Um, 
Um, so just just that point, quick point. So I guess some of these that, that, that makes me feel so good. So uh, <laughs> people, you know, you know, you know, you don't get accolades from your faculty colleagues. So it's good to get external. Pat yeah, on the back. Yeah. Of doing that too, but I I, re I read the the document. I really liked it. Okay, so I guess um, our audience, uh, some of them have have read the book um, as well. Um, I guess when we're waiting for. Um, more people to talk about these questions or hear more about um, this book. I just want to quickly, um, I guess, ask you a question about the writing process. Uh, it's actually kind of related to what Chad just mentioned, sort of, you know, throughout the book, um, in some chapters, especially, you explicitly um, refer to some of the debates um, in the United States currently. And I, I mean, going back to early 2010s, uh, you, you mentioned Steve Pinker and some other scholars and their debates, um, a very public debates about the humanities. So I wonder in this process, in the process of writing this book, you both, you're, you're, you both work on modern Germany, um, intellectual history, institutional history, and you're experiencing going through this process when we keep talking about the crisis of the humanities so in the United States. So I wonder, what was, was it like in the process of writing this book? So did you have a hypothesis or some kind of main argument when you went into this and, and revised it? Or you, you felt this research process and writing process kind of re um, kind of affirm some of your general sentiment or your observations um, um, in your experience as a university prof professor and a humanities <laughs> professor now. Um, I, I think that um, certainly you know, we had our eye on how crisis discourse was evolving in front of us. And as Chad said, there, there are presentist, pretty strongly presentist tendencies in the, in the book. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is confront a, uh, a crisis discourse that is itself extremely present, presentist with its own history and see how it responds, uh, basically. Um, and um, we have our frustrations with, with that discourse that I hope we articulate in a civil and constructive way, um, but it seemed to us that uh, there was a lot of a high level of arbitrariness in that discussion, um, uh, a dismissiveness of past discussions of crisis, um, people saying again and again, you know, things really weren't that bad until now. Um, now they're really bad. There is, you know, a certain bittersweet in being in the moment of crisis, since crisis is supposed to be a decisive moment, right? So it's not easy, but on the other hand, you know, you're at the center of it, um, shaping this decisive moment, maybe turning things around. And people very avidly claim for themselves the position of being at the moment of crisis, dismissing the crisis talk that went before. And so in a way, um, we think that we're taking crisis talk more seriously than a lot of people do in, in investigating this, uh, this history. But you know, some of the, the uh, discussions that we trace in the 19th century, um, we certainly uh, find to be present in our own environment and you know, a, a, a transformed shape generally, but um, not so transformed that it's something entirely different. And as mentioned, um, we, we do try to put the past into conversation with the present in, in, in various ways. Um, one of them um, through a genealogy of decline of the university literature that tries to show how certain central tropes um, have remained very much in place um, since the 1830s. The idea that research universities have become too focused on research, have neglected undergraduate education, that a star system has taken hold um, where people are rewarded primarily for their research. Um, and even if they're disastrous teachers, they get um, the best teaching jobs. Uh, you know, you can, you can find this stuff um, in <clears throat> works uh, from, the, from the 1830s and it's, you know, frankly, pretty striking. Um, and uh, uh, it, it does, I, I, uh, I serve as, 
useful perspective for discussing more recent in, uh, instances of this, this kind of thing. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do, provide the, uh, people who are interested in this discussion and participating in this discussion with the long view rather than offering some kind of prescription um, ourselves. Uh, so we see the book as in that way, having a certain uh, practical value for the present, um, even though it's not a, you know, how we broke it and how we can fix it kind of book. Chad was looking to do that sort of how in the subtitle, but I was just, no, that's a joke. He wasn't looking to do that. I, I, would, I would just add to that again, you know, how I understood, you know, what we were trying to do and maybe perhaps that's a, and why your question is so great. What we ended up doing, whether we do that for readers or not, is probably a separate question. Um, but I also, to put it bluntly, I wanted to figure out what I ought to be fighting for, you know, or, or what I ought to be making my case for. And um, perhaps a few of you or none of you uh, sympathize with this, but, um, you know, I spent, I think the first uh, kind of through my tenure years at, at UVA, assuming that I ought to be fighting for something called the humanities, and then realized I had no idea what in the hell I was actually talking about. You know, I fell back on kind of easy cliched tropes. And, you know, every time I imagined I was defending the humanities, and again, it, it's not incidental that this took place in kind of a political context of kind of in institutional remaking, at least for me here at, in, in Charlottesville. Um, and I wanted to, and so, you know, I historicized it and, and, and tried to, to, to figure out those values and those commitments that were actually worth, um, or at least I thought were, were, were worth fighting for. And so that's all the, the institutional boundary making, you know, myriad instances of this. I know I saw somebody in the chat um, was talking about the debate between humanist and scientist in, in the late 19th century. Um, one of the things that that emerged for us was, in a sense, you know, I think about it as this battle over the soul in the late 19th century between physiologist and philologist, right? So who, and what was fascinating, they both claimed to be pursuing the same ends, which was liberal education, right? And so the argument was who could provide the best form of liberal education, right? A liberating education in all the kind of cliched ways we might even think of it today. And there were those, uh, Helmholtz and uh, Emile de Bois-Raymond, the physiologists who were literally trying to measure kind of the nervous system, uh, rigor, precision. And they used the same adjective to describe what they were doing, pre precise, rigorous, as the philologists, right? Who were also measuring uh, the soul, but in a different way, uh, textually. And, um, you know, that's just one instance where the boundaries were drawn again and again and again but within what was understood to be a shared goal of, in this instance, kind of liberal education or liberal bildung, uh, as, as, as they put it. And um, that kind of helped me make more sense of, of what my colleagues and I were, were fighting over. Um, although I guess, hopefully not. I don't think we were fighting for who provided the best bildung. Uh, there's all kinds of problems with that too, but. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess um, you kind of partly answered a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, do, would you like to um, go into more, a little bit more detail about the, the historical moments, some of the historical moments you feel like very representative in this, the genealogy of the, not only the crisis talk, but the, the crisis of the, 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 the humanities. Uh, perhaps at very least, um, talk a little bit about the reinvention of the humanities in the United States. I think that um, you know one of, one of the important historical moments um, you, uh, you 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 into in this book, and that might also help uh, kind of answer some of these these questions um, in in more uh, depth. Sure. Um, so one very important moment for us. Uh, uh, that connects really directly to the formation of the humanities in the, the US in the early 20th century is uh, Max Weber's famous um, science as a vocation or the work of the scholar uh, speech. Um, one of our, our frustrations with uh, contemporary uh, crisis discourse is, is that um, we see in it 
a tendency to um, to over promising. Um, that's not necessarily so good for the credibility of the humanities. Chad was just talking about the soul and saying, you know, I'm not sure that I um, want to, you know, see myself as as um, figuring that out. But there are humanists who still talk in those terms, of course. Some of them, in fact, Chad's colleagues at the University of Virginia, um, and uh, and Weber um, in this this. Uh, famous speech, one of the things that he's responding to there is his own sense of overpromising in response to crisis. So um, people in 1917 in the humanities felt that the natural sciences were getting an ever larger share of the uh, resources put toward the production of knowledge in Germany. They were um, feeling eclipsed and diminished and um, in a context of specialization. It didn't seem possible to come up with some sort of unified knowledge. Knowledge, in other words, um, in, to use one of Weber's famous terms, seemed to have been disenchanted. Um, and this, <clears throat> for humanists, uh, seemed to hit especially hard because they didn't have some sort of practical value to fall back on. And uh, there were colleagues of, of Weber's also this had to do with the wartime as well, people propagandizing in the classroom, but people also trying to present themselves as prophets of the soul um, at a moment when the youth was itself um, very much looking for direction and reinvention and renewal. And, and um, <clears throat> Weber thought that this was, uh, in his time, uh, a dangerous thing, um, politically dangerous, but also dangerous for the integrity of the, of the humanities. And um, this, debate, um, some of the figures involved in this debate uh, wound up emigrating to the U.S. In fact, one of them, Arthur Zaltz, wound up living in Worthington, where I live. Um, so, you know, in some ways this becomes very close to home and in fact exerted um, an important influence. Some of these figures did. Another key figure, Eric Kahler, um, who was part of the famous Stefan Georga circle in, 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 in Heidelberg, kind of a group that was in rivalry with, with Weber, uh, he wound up giving some uh, foundational talks at Ohio State. Um, and um, this is at a time in the 40s when the notion of the humanities was really taking on its, its, its modern meaning in American institutional life, no longer meaning just the classics, but now referring to the kind of institutional structures that we have in place today. Um, and uh, so, <clears throat> um, so that's uh, uh, one of our key moments. And it's interesting um, to, to me that in responses to the book, and you know, this is not, I'm not trying to suggest here that, <laughs> that you know, we've had a, you know, a, a, a huge response. I mean, we're happy with the attention that the book has gotten, grateful for the attention that we're getting right now. But one of the per persistent uh, themes in the, in the response, and you know, we'll see if this holds up um, as, people continue to respond, hopefully they will, is that um, we have, uh, we were advancing in the book a, a, a kind of Weberian notion of what the humanity should do, and that this is a very much a minimalist thing, a reduced version of, of what the humanities can do. And um, our response is that it only feels reduced in the context of a tradition of overpromising. And in fact, I mean, what Weber is, is offering is a form of Bildung, not necessarily the same Bildung that Humboldt envisioned a uh, hundred years earlier, but nevertheless, a very important thing, um, not just the pursuit of new knowledge, but also um, its own kind of character form, formation and mediation of, of, of values, um, things that you know, are of crucial social importance. Um, but this is still perceived as uh, a, a minimalist melancholy um, version of, of what the humanities can do. Chad, um, do, you, do you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I was just going to say the, the, uh, the Ohio State, there's a, there are a few pages on um, the uh, Ohio State scenario or, or event. This is in the late 50s, I think 57. And it was around, I think it was the Mershon, uh, the Mershon, I don't know if it still exists, professorship. It was an endowed professorship at Ohio State. And then there was a Mershon uh, Institute for the Humanities or Humanistic Inquiry that was founded. And um, an English professor named Roy Pierce uh, prevailed upon the dean, uh, your, one, of, one of your previous deans, uh, I assume, uh, to get this funding to invite an esteemed international 
understood to be European figure uh, to help put Ohio State on the humanities map. And so the, the person they end up deciding to invite, um, the faculty decides to invite or the people in this, in this uh, humanities institute seminar is um, uh, Anson Kala, who is uh, um, uh, Austrian Viennese, uh, comes from a, came from an aristocratic Jewish family from Vienna, turn of the century. And as Paul mentioned, was part of the Stefan Georga Kreis, rather reactionary uh, group of folks, uh, early part of the 20th century. And what's interesting about him with respect to Weber, the story that Paul was telling, he wrote the first just diatribe, this you know, 100 page diatribe um, against uh, Weber's uh, vocation essay, you know, argue, arguing that he had turned inquiry and, and Wissenschaft and Bildung into mere professionalism. And so he immigrates to the US, um, bumps around Columbia uh, and, and, and Princeton, Ohio State in, invites him. But what is fascinating is it's a misapprehension of, of categories. This is why the humanities, the sciences, all the divisions in the university are constantly being remade. And the Ohio State is, is example is an interesting one because the English uh, Roy Pierce invites him and in the letter that he submitted to the dean saying why we should invite Antoine Kala, um, this great you know, European humanistic uh, figure is that he will help us um, bolster our image as a methodologically sound uh, unit of the university and, and, and thus will you know, help put the humanities on the map as a modern science, as it were. And of course, it's surprising how we could actually think that having read anything that um, Foncala wrote. So Foncala gets there and puts on an entire seminar over um, three or four weeks deriding the very notion of method as a unifying orienting ideal of quote humanistic inquiry. So he gets there and completely undercuts the premise of the invitation, which was to put you know, this um, moral act funded state university on the map for humanities, because of course, Rory Pierce is a new critic, right? And so the appeal to method, the appeal to science has a certain import. And so it's a total disaster. Um, but though, these are the, the, the moments that we have throughout the book, and it's, it always returns to this, this idea of permanent crisis is, in, in one way, an, it's always a conflict about that against which the humanities are defined. And von Kahlo, of course, he's defining um, the humanities at that point um, against a, a, a technocratic threat, um, which you know, is, is quickly interpolated uh, as the non-creatives in the Soviet Union who can only do scientific, uh, rational uh, thinking. So. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have to say, I, in the, our own crisis, <laughs> pandemic public health crisis, I, I have been reading a lot of Weber and I really loved how you engaged uh, Max Weber in your book and uh, especially sort of just when you reflect on what we, we're going now and, and what he's pointing out. So it's absolutely wonderful. So let me just invite uh, Professor uh, Barry Kinnan um, to make his comment on the book thesis and, and also um, to talk about his reflection from the humanities in the East Asian tradition. I can see I'm unmuted. I doubt if you can see me though, is that correct? I can see you on my computer screen and I can hear you. Can I, can you see me, Paul? You're not speaking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, following what Ying just brought up, I think your thesis using Weber's 1919 published vocation talk is solid as ever. And my proof of that is that I've worked myself on, as I retired after 45 years in small liberal arts institutions, Mount Holyoke College first, Denison University here in Ohio second. But when you look at the justification for what now is the decline of the humanities in a radical form, which means the students are not coming and they're not coming to small liberal arts institutions largely because the parents are convinced a major in English, in history, in philosophy or in art history will give them no possibility of paying back the loans which uh, they need to pay for tuition uh, debt. 
So it's very real what we're dealing with, but it's the humanities are taking the brunt of the problem. Now, when you look at the justification for them, president after president, and you mentioned a couple Amherst presidents, I think, but I found at Williams College at Dartmouth, there were brilliant statements that justified fully what uh, Max Weber was saying in that 1917 talk. I mean, the word intellectual integrity, I believe is the one that popped in my mind. And it's justified by these college presidents, one after another, I could list a few, in that the way in which the student is, picks up what it means to reason on subjects that are not quantifiable and that are not technical in any manner, that comes from the prof in the classroom. And it works much better at small places. I guess I'm representing that voice here because I haven't been at an R1 university and except for undergraduate work. Anyway, uh, I think that that's really what happens. Uh, the transmission of the integrity of the teacher goes into the student in small classes, particularly seminars, of course. Uh, but uh, because that's true, I just wanted to say from the earlier chapters in your book to the conclusion, the emphasis on Weber and what he, what he singled out as a scholar, as teacher, I think is the key item and it works perfectly for me. So let me stop with that as just an endorsement of the main thesis. Thank you. I may come back to East Asia later. <laughs> the irony of course being that uh, Weber's pedagogical context, which I agree is, 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 really, is really important, was a giant lecture hall. Um, yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but he made this trip through the U.S., right? And he went to the university in 1902. Yeah, no, he, yeah, he visited. Yeah, he visit, He visited, um, but his his teaching context and his right. uh, kind of the context of his arguments were in these giant, um, you know, folies, uh, you know, these the giant lecture, uh, giant lecture courses. All the more brilliant that he got there, I thought, at that point. Well, he was actually. He was, he was out of the game at that point. Um, he hadn't had a university position in, in, in years and uh, played this very interesting role as insider outsider. Um, he, uh, he knew the university system intimately as somebody who had ascended the ranks very quickly and got a full professorship at a, a young age, but then left for mental health reasons, um, but stayed in, involved, uh, produced some scholarship and wrote a lot about university politics in newspapers and had, had nothing to fear really because he was independently wealthy, he wasn't looking for a, a, a job. And he was one of the, uh, the most vigorous and prominent supporters of academic freedom in, in Germany in the early 20th century at a time when um, the state seemed to be coming increasingly heavy handed in uh, making faculty appointments. The state had, had 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 the final authorization all along, but it had tended to really take into account um, the faculty's desires. And it started doing that uh, less. Um, the political position of the candidates um, mattered in some cases in ways that Weber found uh, extremely problematic. And he waited on this very, uh, very avidly. This is another, uh, aspect of the book um, that uh, I would just would like to throw out there that there, there is a running discussion of academic freedom and how um, the <clears throat> how this story that we're telling um, relates to that uh, it, it, in the book. It's not a, a, a primary theme, but, um, but it's there and it's something of course that's very much in the news now. So um, hopefully uh, that will, will be of interest to people. Um, thank you. So I, before I ask uh, you to address Tina Sessa's question, I guess I just want to make sure you don't have more to say about um, the first two questions. Uh, one is what categories emerge to be more useful than humanities, science, and liberal arts? Um, and the other question was about sort of the debates between the, um, the humanities and the scientists in the 19th century Germany, so. I'll say one, one quick, um, and this is a general comment about how we try to address the question of categories and taxonomies 
especially as they come to take shape in institutions. I, at least for me, and I don't know if, if Paul would, would agree, but I think what I understand our focus to be on, yes, we map out the categories and the taxonomies, um, but we try to disentangle those from something like epistemic practices or intellectual practices, right? And, 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 and I think that's the conflation of institutional category, say the social sciences, the natural and physical sciences, the humanities. Um, you know, on our account, all too quickly consume and almost exhaust what are much more interesting and I would say compelling and diverse and conflicting intellectual practices that happen all the time, um, both individually, but also institutionally and socially within those bigger categories. And, and so it's, it's less the categories and it's more or what we try to bring out in these conflicts um, are the practices that allow for certain forms of continuity, certain forms of disruption, um, but also certain kinds and unexpected um, communities uh, that, that built up around those. And for a host of reasons that we, we try to go into, those are all too often shoehorned into institutional categories for purposes that um, I, I we could at least say are not necessarily internal to the intellectual practices that we try to uh, really describe and are put to a lot of the, and this kind of goes into Tina Sessa's question um, about uh, put to external ends or the socioeconomic kind of conditions, whatever um, they may be in, in the various stories. Paul, I don't know if you want to address that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the relationship of the natural sciences and, and the humanities, um, uh, which were really only talked about as the humanities in Germany starting in the late 19th century under the term Geisteswissenschaften. Um, this is a, a, a big part of the book and it's a story of, of allies and rivals to borrow a, a phrase from the title of a, a, another book about the history of the German university that's just out and is a very interesting. Um, as Chad mentioned, um, there was a, a sense of some sense of solidarity um, some sense of pursuing a common cause. Um, and this is the story of, uh, in, in part, of people who care deeply about knowledge um, of, the, of, of the self, um, about the university. Um, but it's also the story of people extremely concerned with status. And uh, there was a, a, a real fight for status between natural scientists and uh, humanists in in Germany. And uh, with both sides um, resisting uh, any kind of vocationalization of, of higher education. Um, Humboldt uh, did a, an interesting uh, job of balancing different I ideals, competing ideals, the practical and the pure. Um, at a certain point, German academics and at a certain point in the 19th century really seized on this idea of pure knowledge as um, the source of their status and saw anything that uh, threatened this as, as being a, a great threat and resisted to the point where um, in the early 20th century, the German government frustrated um, by this attachment to, to pure knowledge founded research institutes outside the university that wouldn't be like R&D centers, but where research would be conducted with an eye to solving practical problems. And these evolved into the, uh, the, the Max Planck Institutes. And for the same reason, and now I'm getting over to Tina's question. Um, so you have um, natural scientists and humanists both uh, claiming or claiming against each other at times um, that they're really doing the central thing. Interestingly, Wilhelm von Humboldt's own brother, Alexander von Humboldt in 1828 claimed that now we have entered, we were you know, doing something else. Now we've entered the, the, the era of the natural sciences. Um, and Humboldt actually um, in a somewhat melancholy tone agreed with him uh, late, late in, late in his, his life. Um, but for the same reason, for the same um, intense focus on status access was also an accessibility was also a, a, a burning question in these debates, the German university system until the Weimar Republic was, was very small, but of course, 
it was expanding and it was always seemed bigger than it had been because it always was. And the government um, at various times put pressure on the university to open itself up to more students, different kinds of students, not just students who had graduated from elite gymnasium um, high schools where there were very substantial Greek and Latin requirements, but also from high schools that had something of a vocational bent to them. Um, there were fights over whether medical students um, should have Greek and the medical faculties wanted doctors to speak Greek because it was a status enhancing thing. The government wanted to waive the requirement because there was a need for doctors. Um, at the same time, uh, the government was also very concerned about the prospect of unemployed academics, especially as more people from um, the lower classes entered the university system. Bismarck um, was very worried about the academic proletariat as he called it. And one of the reasons why we have such um, exact statistics about university enrollments at this time was that um, <clears throat> the government commissioned people to keep track of this, how many people were graduating, how many people were getting jobs. Um, so I hope that's not a complete answer to Tina's question, but, but uh, uh, and the natural sciences question, of course, but I, I hope that it, it, it goes some way in, in answering those questions. And I'll just offer a quick kind of counter example. It's not really a counter example. Another example of how questions of access and the socioeconomic conditions condition this conflict over what are the humanities, what are not the humanities, uh, kind of post-war, Cold War US. So Clark Kerr as um, president of the University of California, he's for chancellor of Berkeley, and then he's president of the University of California. Uh, he, he joins a commission headed by um, Watson Jr., then CEO of uh, IBM, and a to write this human the State of the Humanities uh, report in the late 50s, um, early 60s. No, wait, actually, it's, it's the early 60s, but they, they had already been kind of uh, d discussing this. And this is the report that's that's done by the Phi Beta Kappa Society, the um, AC ACLS, and there's a third institution that is, uh, can't remember. It's the report that ultimately lays the groundwork for the NEH legislation. And so here, this is a moment as, as you know, everybody pro is probably familiar with when where enrollments are exploding, right? This is the quote, golden age of US higher education between 50 and 1970. Um, and this is right in the middle, right before the collapse, you know, around 1970. And their argument for the humanities as these enrollments are exploding, especially at big public universities like the Ohio States, uh, like uh, the UCs, is that the humanities are needed above all because of leisure. Right? Because in this, this is still when the economy, the, the imagined economy is thought to be in a perpetual growth cycle, right? This is the, the, the age of abundance, the, the post-scarcity society. And you still have this kind of Keynesian um, dream that's invoked in the report very explicitly of the 10 hour work week. And the question becomes, what are all of these workers, you know, these middle class that we're creating, uh, say these titans of industry and titans of, of the system of higher education, what are they gonna do with all this free time, right? What are they gonna do when they only have to work 10 hours a week? What are they gonna do when they have all of this uh, leisure time? The humanities. Right. So the humanities, you know, they're, 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 they're not about uh, nothing, nothing like kind of this 19th century philological imagination, nothing uh, about the unity of knowledge, nothing uh, about moral or ethical claims, uh, nothing about, uh, you know, in a sense bolstering democracy, as it were. Um, it is, that's what, that's what we're going to do when we have a post-scarcity society um, to kind of um, assuage and keep the cap on uh, any political unrest. Is, is, is the humanities, right? So this is, you know, in this report, it's in uh, Kerr's uh, descriptions and accounts of um, the UC system. You know, he uh, helped kind of mastermind the California master plan of higher education. And so at least in my mind, you, you, can't, you can't read that without this broader question is bildung, right? Or the humanities or certain forms of knowledge or inquiry only for the rich. Um, yeah, maybe, but, but they're also, uh, to mollify the masses, uh, as it were, and that you know that's the report that, ironically enough, 
um, motivates Congress uh, to, to, to um, fund the counter NSF, as it were, with the NEH. Uh, though, like, not even a tenth of the uh, funding. Okay, um, so I guess the next few questions I want to kind of probably they're related. One is uh, about money <laughs> value, uh, the crisis created by asking students to pay for an education that includes scientific knowledge that has monetary value and the humanities education that has no monetary value and instead cultivate students' humanity. Um, how do you how to reconcile these goals? And the next question what light does your book shed on current demands for the humanities to help students become ethical individuals? What do you see as a history of the idea of the humanities as moral education? And this is kind of related to um, the question we got from the, just for the, um, for the panelists um, from Professor Curtis about the human and you talk about this actually in your book. So the question itself uh, was, um, so, well, thanks for offering this. I've always thought about humanities as typical, as topically coherent, but as such with a foundational role in academy, we articulate in our multiple disciplines, a theory of the human, quote unquote, that operates within our students' self-understanding as they develop their lives and careers. In other words, we are laying the grand narrative foundation that provides students tools to navigate their own humanity in this complex world. So questions are first, would you agree with this characterization? And second, if so, would each reflect a bit on the theory of the human, quote unquote, that emerges out of the scholarship today? Yeah, I'll reflect on it, and uh, no, I think I think that's the narrative uh, that um, that we want to show is relatively recent and institutionally interested and functionalizes a whole range of intellectual practices, right? Uh, so you know I, that's why the the last chapter, even though it's the last chapter on the on the United States, I think is actually um, the most salient because that is where you first see all of these disparate disciplines, right? Art history, uh, religious studies, psychology at various points, um, literature, theology even uh, in, in initially, this, all of these disparate disciplines are not really called forth and collected until the 1930s, uh, late 19, uh, over the 30s, and uh, especially in the, the post-war era into something called the humanities, right? So you have this array of disciplines that are called forth to form this kind of institutional interest block. And they, they have to do a lot of inventing, right? They, ha they, have to, they have to invent in a way the Renaissance. Um, one of the more fascinating, I think, discourses is the recovery of the, the era of recovery, right? The, 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 the recovery of the rebirth uh, era. So this is the, the explosion of Renaissance studies in uh, mid 20th century US, all in the name of what is constituted as, you know, the human. And, and so I, you know, that's the historical part, but, but I, would, I would say um, kind of normatively speaking, that was precisely the ideological project, right? The, it, it was this project to cobble together all of these interest groups in the name of something like the human or the Western Civ courses. I mean, these are when the Western civilization courses uh, were, uh, were created as an interest block over and against the natural sciences, over and against the emergent, and at that point, even bigger, social sciences, right? Again, the, the social science discourse was um, not, not just ascendant at that point, it was institutionally, but also I would even politically, um, much much uh, more significant than anything like the like the humanities. And one, you know, one, in, I think, kind of factoid that 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 at least for me shows how ideological this project was. You know, this these invocation of these general education programs, these general education courses over the course of the 20th century, um, always invoke the Columbia's. Um, as kind of one of the first, but Columbia's began uh, during World War I as what was called a war aims course, right? It didn't begin with the great books that came after, 
right, in, in the early 20s. The first iteration of Columbia's general education program was a war course, right? And, and it was explicitly a war course, you know, when the president asked the faculty, what can we do to support um, the cause of the war? And and so this general education program, that which everybody should know who graduates from Columbia, was what are the true and rightful aims of the war in which the nation is engaged? Um, and I, I think that's kind of helpful when we kind of hear the invocations of the human or we hear the invocations of the humanities as this monolithic project to inculcate X, Y, or Z. Um, it, it's, it's rarely actually ab that abstract, I would argue. Paul may uh disagree he might he, he might believe in, in in that right paul your your humanistic uh, spirit never dies yes um i'm old school in these matters um well one of the things that we're one another strand of discussion um of, of the humanities that we're pushing against is not so much the crisis talk as recent attempts to create a grand narrative of the humanities and this is the context in which we develop this idea of the modern humanities. Um, so we're um, not uh, super sympathetic in the book to the idea of a unifying ideal. Um, I'm speaking in particular of James Turner's book, um, Philology, which uh, undertakes to show that the humanistic study um, is organized around a certain set of methodological ideals and practices that have been in place basically everywhere that humanities have been uh, practiced from um, ancient times to today. Uh, Renz Boat, uh, a historian of the humanities, has in some ways gone even further um, trying to locate uh, humanistic scholarship or, or continuities between the humanistic scholarship that was practiced in the ancient world um, and the humanistic scholarship of today, I don't doubt that there are some continuities, but at a certain point, you know, you're at a level of generality where they're, um, they're not you know, that interesting or illuminating. Um, so, um, so we're going in a, in a, in a bit of a, of a different direction there, even though of course, as I've emphasized, we are looking for continuities ourselves of a, of a, of a different sort, perhaps. Um, another, uh, um, idea that's important in the book uh, that connects with this question, also some other questions that I've already discussed a, a little bit is, is the idea that for the uh, architects of the modern university in, in, in Germany, um, there was the sense or among them, there was the sense that some of the very forces that were and they, they were humanists and looking to put the humanities at the center of the univer university it hadn't been there um, they uh, for, for them the very forces that were uh, creating this moment of opportunity democratization secularization bureaucratic rationalization were also um, threatening in some ways and um, Tina asked about is Dolung only for the rich um, for these um, architects of the university and also of the ideal of Bildung? Um, definitely not. Fichte um, is one of these figures uh, from a very humble background, suffered at times um, under pretty extreme material scarcity. And in his plan for uh, a new university in, in Berlin, um, this was uh, a result of the Napoleonic conquest in, in Prussia, where Prussia lost its flagship university and this launched a discussion about whether it should have a new university. Um, this ultimately um, led to the founding of the University of Berlin in 1810. Um, Fichte has a, a section in there, at times he's speaking in terms of what liberal arts can do, their practical value here too, they sound very much uh, uh, like some of the things that we hear today about how this, these are basically Fichte's words that the that the that liberal education is really what he's talking about for the most part um, teaches students how to learn and how um, citizens who can do that will be more capable whatever job they're doing than citizens who haven't had that training um, which you know remains a justification for general education programs but Fichte also has a significant section in there about um, about the need for students um, from 
poor backgrounds, to have subsidized meals by the university, uh, this kind of thing. And uh, at the same time, of course, um, it Bildung, uh, practically speaking, um, was to a large degree for the rich. The university system um, was attended in the first half of the 19th century um, disproportionately by wealthy people. It, you know, it, it cost money to support people um, and uh, uh, to just be out of the workforce and take classes. Um, one had to survive somehow and there wasn't you know, a culture of having a job on the side while you were a student. Nietzsche wrote a lot of letters home to his mother asking for money when he was a student in Bonn. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, some of that is, 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 is quite moving stuff. Um, Things opened up um, a bit in the later part of the 19th century, and this is one of the reasons why there were these heated debates about uh, about access and status and and prestige. But one of the the areas of of uh, over promising that that Chad and I um, discuss in the in the book is um, where there's the claim being made that this kind of humanistic building that Barry was talking about having participated in, in liberal arts, small liberal arts colleges can be done on a much larger scale. And um, that kind of remains an open, um, an open question. Um, the general education programs today, I mean, we've seen this at Ohio State where we recently redid our general education program and the justification um, has different notes in it, but somewhere in there is the idea that liberal education, the examined life is, 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 is still a good thing. Um, but uh, there are these questions that remain study of the human, but there are these questions of, uh, <clears throat> that remain about the scalability um, of, of, of this and, um, um, and whether most general education programs really, um, despite their rhetoric today at large universities, uh, allow for it, the kind of uh, humanistic education that was spelled out in the question. I, I, one, one thing I, I wanna note, and this is kind of central to our narrative, is that the late 19th century represented such a caesura um, in the university because for the first time, something like the humanities, right? Uh, these, these, these skills, uh, philological skills, um, oratorical skills, logical skills, uh, moral argument skills were constituted as their own distinct and self-sustaining division within the university called the philosophy faculty, right? In, 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 in the Prussian universities um, that could offer their own PhD. Prior to that, they had always been, right? From Kant's famous, you might know this, um, discussion in, in, in the conflict of the faculties, they had always been considered the lower faculties and they were lower in the order of the university, you know, going back to at least um, 13th century Paris, because they were they prepared students for entry into one of the three professional faculties, law, uh, medicine, or theology. And that was understood, it was understood that every student, every professional, should have the capacities and the skills and the dispositions that were presumably cultivated in the lower faculty. So it wasn't until the 19th century in which that lower faculty, you know, what variously was called the Studia Humanitatis, uh, what, what we now call quote, the hum humanistic skills, it wasn't until much later that they were um, kind of reinvented as their own self-sustaining end in themselves forms of inquiry. And so the, the division, I would even argue, between monetary and non-monetary, as, uh, as was put in the, the, the chat, um, that was, that division itself, um, use, not use, right, practical, impractical, um, for its own sake or for some external end, that in and of itself was part of this discourse that we're talking about, at least when you uh, talk about kind of the historical contours of the, of the university. And you know, just personally, uh, kind of normatively, I I'm much more comfortable and confident in making arguments about practices and skills as opposed to soul building, soul forming, or um, any of the other what we now call humanistic uh, ends. I, I see the humanistic ends in much more prosaic, uh, perhaps uh, less high-minded, high-minded terms. Um, 
and I think that's a kind of a product of, for me at least, this this project. If I can add one 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 thing to this, and then we'll we'll get to another question. Um, I don't know of a state that's simply given money to universities to just go off and um, pursue knowledge in an open-ended way without any kind of pressure to deliver some sort of practical good. And there was a uh, certainly a twist here uh, in the early in the early 19th century when the humanities um, became the center of the German university um, and uh, they were not simply there to prepare students for what was called higher study, there was still the idea, of course, that they would deliver some kind of practical value. This is the paradox of impractical, the paradoxical practicality of impractical education, again, that it leads to um, bureaucrats and uh, pastors who are uh, capable of operating on a a higher level, and it's an argument that's still very much in use to, to justify this. Um, Princeton recently reissued um, this little pamphlet by Abraham Flexner, who uh, ran the Institute for Advanced Study for a long time in the um, early 20th century, called the, uh, the, the Practicality of Impractical Knowledge, where he's basically channeling uh, Humboldt and Schleiermacher and, and Fichte and these arguments um, that they made. There was, there, there was always um, pressure there to deliver something. And one of the more uh, remarkable parts of the story, I think, is, is how in um, Prussia in the 1820s and 30s, some of these ideals um, of liberal education being at the center more than vocational education um, uh, were formally institutionalized in, in, in Prussia and research productivity became institutionalized as a crucial standard for academic advancement. In fact, the no book, no tenure requirement can be traced um, to, to this moment. It's remarkable because uh, Prussia uh, took a conservative turn in the 1820s and 30s in the restoration moment. Um, <clears throat> and, and yet um, the minister of, of uh, culture, Karl von Altenstein um, was a great admirer of, of, of Fichte and managed um, by being very skillful at a moment when there was a lot of suspicion of universities and police spies at universities and um, a couple of high profile cases of academics being removed for what was considered to be um, politically subversive activity. Um, at this moment, um, he went, um, he, he was able to institutionalize ideals that weren't formally institutionalized when the University of Berlin opened in 1810, the, formal justification there was still to train teachers and pastors, basically that. Um, but it was clear that the founders wanted something else. And this could have turned out otherwise very easily. And I'm obviously not suggesting that it was simply due to Altenstein alone that it happened, but he played a, a, a significant role. And um, I personally think that this is <clears throat> one of the more, um, again, remarkable parts of the story that we tell. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the argument is, is essentially you have to have liberally trained, i.e. trained at that point uh, in uh, ancient philology, right, as the core, bureaucrats. And why do you have to have philologically trained, liberally minded bureaucrats? So they can see the whole in these complex institutions that is the Prussian state. Um, so, so even, you know, liberal education is always put, right, uh, to, to certain ends. So therefore you need it. A philologist as bureaucrats, so they could understand the institutions in which they found themselves, and thus make for more efficient, more productive uh, bureaucratic, rationalized structures. Yeah, I mean, that, making, that's a hell of an argument for the humanities. I'll, I'll stick with that. In making a play for this, um, in writing to the to the king, King Friedrich Wilhelm III, um, Humboldt you know, and uh, very directly says this: this is going to be good for the state. The state needs this kind of knowledge that only these kinds of people can can produce. Um, but in order to produce this knowledge, the humanities need freedom, freedom and solitude. Um, and so he's walking this, this uh, narrow path that, you know, has never been easy for universities to, to go down. I mean, you see, like, you, you see an analog argument in, in Bell's argument uh, uh, for the general education curriculum at Columbia in the late 60s, where you, the most important kind of knowledge today in our complex uh, as he, he will call it in about two or three years at that point in the late 60s, he'll call it our post-industrial society is general knowledge. 
and that's that's where you you know you, you see at that time you're, you see the explosion of these revised general uh, curricula that emphasize um, categories of knowledge, general categories of knowledge, and as Bell understood them, that is the type of education, that is the type of quote, person uh, that has to be created in our universities. We need general general knowers, right? So they can become the general managers uh, and the general elite managers of all of our uh, kind of bureaucratic, rationalized Cold War structures. It, but it, it's it's still, I think, analogous to that Prussian. Uh, philologically inflected bureaucrat um, education that was postulated as, as the ideal. Um, so there's a follow-up question uh, about the human. <laughs> so do you reject the idea that humans as a theoretical subject exist, or are you theorizing that the differences between each individual are greater than any coherent set of experiences. And if this is the case, what meaning or meanings are being navigated by humanist scholars? I'm not well, that sounds like a question you'd love to answer. Yeah, I'm not seeing this question. I need to look at it. Oh, uh, it's in the, um, if you click on Q and A, um, these are questions that only the panelists can see, not in the chat box. Q and A. Okay. Can you see it? Um, sorry, it's probably not that interesting to watch me try to read this question. Um, okay, while Paul reads, um, I'll, I'll per perhaps a, a bit more jocular, but uh, also uh, earnest uh, response uh, to that. Um, I think. Historically and conceptually, I think what we try to, to show in the book is uh, invocations of the human, institutionally speaking and conceptually speaking, um, are much less abstract, uh, much less capacious than uh, we, we might imagine when we talk about the human. Right? They're, they're pretty particular. Uh, they're particular projects that are, that are trying to be achieved, whether they're institutional goals, whether they're socio-political uh, goals. Um, but that in itself is 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 is, is abstract. Um, for for me, what I would argue, both in terms of the book, but also kind of normatively now, um, is that I think one of the the greatest disservices of the modern humanities um, has been to accept, in a way, responsibility or to claim even retroactively. Um, for moral questions and ethical questions, because what that did, that, that settlement where you have science does the work of producing um, knowledge that can be monetized, that can be turned into technology, that can defend the state, that can um, advance civilization, you know, whatever, you know, arguments that you make. And all of the questions about ethics, all the questions about meaning and then a value and interpretation um, are then shunted off, cordoned off, limited fenced around this thing called the humanities. And the social sciences in, in the US play a, an interesting uh, role uh, over the course of the 20th century to, to sometimes mediate that. And I think that does two things. Um, one, it puts an impossible burden on these forms of knowledge that understand themselves as, as part of this humanities project. But two, it also excuses, quote, the sciences from taking up these questions from the get-go. And I think you see it now. I, I, I know Ohio State, aren't you guys hiring like 20 computer scientists? Um, my God, I think that's the bigger than the entire uh, MLA uh, job list this year. And but but what that does is you get these inane, to my mind, because because I had to take some of them when I studied in the engineering school here at UVA a couple years ago. Um, you get these, uh, I call them um, post facto ethics courses in CS programs where, okay, the real scientists, the real technologists, the real knowers have produced the knowledge and now we need some humanities people to come in and come up with some moral schema or come up with a, uh, the how to deal morally with the consequences for what we've created. I think this is in part the settlement of the permanent crisis. And to my mind, that is both intellectually, um, morally and also politically disastrous, right? Uh, to 
to shunt these questions, to cordon questions of ethics uh, and of moral concern into one domain and to turn and to functionalize them within the system called the, the modern university. And so that's why I really resist questions about, you know, reflection on the human, uh, you know, redounds to the humanities, because that's supposed to put an undue burden on uh, the humanities and well, also to excuse, quote, the sciences from what I would argue is also their kind of eth um, epistemic responsibility as well. But that's how the modern university came to be structured for you know, pretty particular uh, interest. I muted myself. Um, yeah, I, I agree um, with that. Generally speaking, I'd also like to speak briefly to the moral education part of the question. And um, there has, as noted in the question, uh, been a call for, or there at various times has been a call for some kind of return to moral education. That's a fairly standard part of, of uh, decline of the university literature. Um, and, uh, but not only there, it, it's, it's, it's come from elsewhere too. Um, in one of her last graduation addresses, uh, Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, talked about how um, we at universities need um, to pay attention also or to acknowledge our responsibilities to moral education and not simply to research and the production of knowledge, you know, how that would work out, um, how you can do both things at once. Uh, that's that's not so easy. And there is a counter discourse to this. Um, uh, one of the <coughs> um, main figures there is Jonathan Haidt, um, who basically says that you have to choose. Um, you can do one thing, um, produce open-ended knowledge, promote free inquiry, or you can teach values. You can't do both. One of the reasons why Weber appeals, uh, Weber's speech appeals to, to, to me, to us, I think, Chad, you can um, jump in and, and correct me if I'm um, wrong in characterizing your position in this way, uh, is that it does offer a kind of third way um, in that it emphasizes that the values needed for academic inquiry are also, the, uh, are, are also ethical values. Um, values that some of the same values that the people who claim that we should return to the moral to, to, to a moral education model are pushing a tolerant uh, <clears throat> a, a, a inability to listen to diverse viewpoints, um, a uh, civility uh, toward your interlocutors and independent mindedness, independent mindedness and a boldness, um, the boldness uh, that you need to, to go off on your own and, uh, and, and argue a point that's not necessarily popular, but that you think is the, the, the right one. And then of, of course, there's also the whole mediation side of, of uh, uh, the, or the mediation of values side of Faber's argument, where he talks about how professors shouldn't tell you what ultimate values to subscribe to, but they can talk to you about the social consequences of subscribing to this or that value. So I see it uh, in this context of discussion of values education as, as offering a really interesting and productive uh, third way. And um, uh, again, the book is not generally prescriptive, but there's the suggestion in the book that this might indeed be a productive way to go. I'm finished, Chad, you can, you can jump in. Uh, no, that, that's it. I actually have to go in a, in, in a, few, in a few minutes. I don't know um, if we're almost near time. We, we've got time for a bit more, Ying, I think. Yeah. So I guess, um, I guess um, because Chad has to uh, live in a few minutes, I have a question. Actually, I think both of you can, can, can um, I hope to kind of you to answer sort of, you look, re reflected on the, the making of modern humanities. You, look, you reflected on the history of modern humanities. Do you, I mean, <laughs> I'm a pre-modernist and you invoke some postmodernists in your book as well. So I'm looking at it on the long run and I wanted you to kind of um, talk a little bit about sort of, do you think since modernity is not a complete project, it's still, it's ongoing, it's an incomplete project. Do you think the making of modern humanities, this project 
part of the modernity project is co complete. I cannot imagine more subjects being lumped into <laughs> humanities anymore. Um, is digital humanities, for instance, a, a new part of this incomplete uh, production of uh, modernity or modern humanities? You know, this is um, so. So Paul and I, you know, we, we tried to not make this a, a manifesto or offer anything helpful. Even you might, you might have put it so as to avoid questions like these. Um, no, knowing that you know, they would be welcome and we would love to talk about them uh, afterwards. Um, so what I'm going to say is I, I don't know what Paul would say about it, and I think what writing this book did for me, and I don't think it's a necessary conclusion, I don't know if Paul would agree with it, is that the humanities is, is not a very fruitful or helpful term right now, uh, institutionally, politically, but also intellectually, at least at least for me. Um, so when you ask, you know, something about kind of like computational humanities or the, the digital humanities, what I'm more compelled to, to talk about, what I'm actually more interested in institutionally and intellectually are whatever practices um, might fall under under there, and so my deep sympathies with the lo a long tradition of philology jive actually really well with some of the basic concerns among my computational humanity uh, humanities friends. Uh, and you know, actually, you know, last last semester, Andrew Piper and I, uh, he's at he's at McGill. We we taught a graduate seminar on uh, philology and machine learning, and I mean, it was like old school philology text. I mean, we were reading Schleiermacher as we were, you know, um, reading, you know, development of, um, you know, uh, you know, topic analysis uh, algorithms and, and, and neural net, you know, stuff like that. And because to me, they the, the practices are similar, even though the scales are profoundly uh, perhaps different of data collection, data curation, and, and data transmission. Right, the the interest in what the you know the German tradition would call überlieferung, right? So this question of transmission of of knowledge, and how that is how that is done. I mean, that's what um, computer scientists and machine learning experts are dealing with right now, right? How do we constitute our data sets, um, and what is actually in these data sets, um, and how does that affect not just the collections themselves, but the conditions of possibility for any interpretive practice um, that we might apply to them you know so that's I'm not, I'm not evading your question by so my frank answer is humanities i'm not you know i'm i don't think i'm interested in that right now but what i am interested in is what that might help us understand and discern as practices because there you see the continuities and and, and and differences in ways that i've personally found intellectually but also institutionally much more um satisfying so um so do you you, you're not only calling into question the rhetoric and the discourse of crisis, but also humanities itself, right? Yeah, I think I think that's kind of where I am, and we I intentionally didn't address that in in the book. I'm, I'm not sure if it was because we disagreed or because we just wanted to avoid it. Uh, Paul, um, I don't. Where where are you? Well, it seemed like a big thing to drop at the end. <laughs> <laughs> in conclusion, <laughs> that is the done. Um, but I, I uh, would like to add to this, um, I suppose, uh, one, one point, um, which is that, uh, let me, I'm gonna go back to Weber and, and, and start there. I've, we've been um, giving a kind of hagiography of Weber. We're, we're also critical of, of Weber. One point we're particularly critical of is his attitude toward the, the academic job market. He spends a lot of time at the beginning of his sciences vocation lecture talking about how terrible these uh, conditions are and, and all the, the, the hardship um, that people go through and has some memorable lines in there about how like in no nowhere else in the in, in the work world do you find such arbitrariness um, as in uh, the the academic job market and if you can't deal with the idea of someone who's less talented and accomplished than you occupying a much better institutional position, then you definitely shouldn't go into academia. That's one of his pieces of advice for these young students he's, he's speaking to. Um, and he has uh, there a, a kind of uh, oddly defeatist position given his 
activist tendencies as a commentator on, on universities. He basically just says, well, this is how it is. This is how it has to be. Um, when in fact, um, not necessarily Germany, you know, as a, uh, well, in wartime, there wasn't going to be a big change of the academic job market um, given wartime scarcity. Um, but clearly, Germany at times had the resources to do things differently. And uh, throughout the 19th century, even as the German university was um, a place people from all over the world were going to, 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 uh, to study, widely considered to be the best university system in the world, uh, the academic labor conditions were, were terrible. And they clearly affected the kind of knowledge that was developed in the humanities and elsewhere. It was a big driver of specialization um, because when you're desperate to, to get a job when the conditions are extremely hard, then what are you likely to do? You're likely to do work that will help you fit in um, rather than take some kind of risk and do um, an innovative multidisciplinary project. And um, I'm interested, and, and I know Chad is as, as well, in um, looking at uh, labor conditions and how they affect humanities scholarship going forward in the in the here and now because clearly you know we're, we're seeing some shifts and um, in fact uh, Chad and I are hoping to launch a, a book series on on this in a way um, reprising the question that led to Weber's talk which was the future of intellectual work as a vocation that's the question that he was asked to speak to and that's the question that we want to organize our our series around and it's it's uh, in that way that I want to continue to in investigate um, the evolution of the humanities. That's great. Uh, Chris, Chris? Yeah, I actually, I had a question, uh, a comment. Um, I don't think we'll really get time to discuss this, but I really just wanted to sort of return to Heather's question really about the sciences. Um, and their relationship to the humanities, which you trace in the book. And it's obviously a, a more complicated non-linear history than we may think. But another reason I think where the humanities um, has perceived itself to be under threat from science is not just about the question of earning money. It's also because of the sciences increasing claim to speak to and of and about the human. Um, through the development of, of all kinds of sciences from, you know, think about behavioral economics, which is, seems to be um, you know, very much in vogue right now, the neurosciences, um, which it seem to be continually chipping away at um, the idea of the, the sort of, not necessarily the autonomous individual, but, but understanding how and why we make the choices we do. And so this I think is possibly been one reason, one explanation for, for how and why the, the humanities have tended to swerve into phases of, of profound obfuscation, such as the, the, the post-structuralist phase. There are many reasons why we took that turn, um, but claiming refuge in, in something incredibly abstruse seems to have been one, one reaction uh, to the position of the sciences. So I think there's, there, is a, there is a whole other, and as you, you talk in the book about the, the rise of the social sciences, which you say are, are just sciences really I mean that the, the um, but these are sciences which increasingly speak to the human condition um, through um, the scientific method through quantification leaving the humanities to to be in a situation where they almost have to um, espouse only the qualitative um, which in some situations almost seems like the irrational um, so I mean, this is another. This is a. But this is something that's very, very sort of late twentieth century, early twenty first century. I think that, no. I, oh, sorry. No, it's all right. I was. No, I, 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 I. It, it's it's a it's a great question, and and it's one we actually I don't think really take up well enough because we just kind of allude in ways to the social sciences, and it's it's I think it, it would be crucial, and you could write an entire other kind of micro history, or maybe it's a bigger history of what happened to the humanities between, yeah, say like 1950, 1970, 1975, and especially the rise of economics as that right. um, uh, predominant discipline, which on the one hand, yes, is um, understands itself to be quote scientific through appeals to um, quantitative methods, um, causal inference uh, claims, and the humanities kind of in, in, in response to that. But then you have, you know, fascinating um, detours there 
I kind of like thinking how you would write this in my head right now, um, kind of uh, the rise of neoliberalism with, with Hayek and the irreducibility uh, of human action, you know, Polanyi, his kind of odd back and forth, and then kind of ultimately uh, joining up in, in certain ways with Hayek. And all of that comes down to, as, as you were suggesting, questions about human agency, right? And so you, mm -hmm. you oddly enough, you know, the appeal of Hayek to a certain degree um, as, as, a, as a theoretician of, of knowledge and human agency is, I think, in part, kind of a reaction against kind of the over-quantification of economics. And so Hayek's success, as it were, is that he he like colonizes the humanities or quote humanistic inquiry uh, because he opens up this space um, for irreducibility in, in all of these things. And so I think you could tell a story of the humanities uh, over against and contradistinction to the rise of economics and the economization of thought where Hayek at all, I'm just kind of using him as a synecdoche for all these other figures. Um, he becomes his own refuge, a refuge of, of, of sort. And then, of course, all the more recent work on neoliberalism and Foucault uh, and Lyotard and his postmodern condition. All of this is happening uh, in, in the 70s. And it would be from an institutional historical perspective, not just from a, as part of a history of knowledge perspective. That, yeah, I think that's, that's actually kind of amazing. So like economics and the humanities right. uh, in kind of 1950 to 1980 or something. Um, because yeah, I think that's the moment we seem to be living in right, right now. It definitely shaped the institutions in which I think probably all of us, it seems like, work here in, right? I mean, that's where the, the financing and the financialization of higher education, that's where it took place in, in the 70s. Right. So that's, that's a great, I'm, I'm writing that down. The economics is a, is a kind of master discipline uh, yep. explaining human behavior. Um, yep. Now, we are two minutes over, and it's my fault. Um, so I want to apologize for that. Um, I would like to thank Paul, Chad, and Ying so much for what's been a really illuminating discussion. And I really hope that um, the, this project um, continues to generate discussion um, and continues to generate uh, future scholarship, because I think it opens up so many questions, um, not just about history, but about where we are today and what exactly we do. Um, because reading the book made me realize that I very often don't reflect on what I do. <clears throat> and if I do... It's nice and purple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's the book. Um, it's a lilac. Um, it's it's nice. It's got a very nice cover. So um, I want to just thank you very much. Say thank you. Thank you all so much for attending. Thanks for all your questions. And um, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you so much. No, no problem. Thanks Bye. So much. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Bye.